It's Monday, September 23rd at 7.03 p.m. And tonight we have a series of committee meetings, the first of which is Planning and Development Committee that's chaired by Council Member Fall, and she's joined by Council Members Reisner, McGee, and Grace. Thank you. Um, we just have one agenda item. Um, this has been put forward by the Planning Commission and the BZA. Um, many times when people go to do certain types of, of um, improvements to their house or something, um, they have to go in, and check with code and get a permit. Um, and when it is found that the specific action may not follow the code, the zoning code, um, Title 23, um, is that then they go to the BZA to go through the Board of Zoning Appeals to get a variance. Um, the Board of Zoning Appeals has put forward um, a, a memorandum to the Planning Commission. Planning Commission has sent it forward to us to um, help reduce the amount of um, variances that are very regular. Um, building certain things within setback. Improving or rebuilding your carport that may be in a setback in the front of your house. Um, the deck is falling apart. Your deck, because you and are, are in a very small lot, may be in the setback um, um, of the backyard. But your, your lot, you know, you have your deck there, it's falling apart. You want to make it nicer or better. Currently, you would have to go through the process of going through the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, it is now put forward by the board and by the planning commission that in those situations where it's not a, um, where the, the new use is not objectionable as the current use, so you're not putting anything bigger, taller, chicken coopy in the wrong area, as Jeff has suggested, mm -hmm. um, that these should not have to go through the bo Board of Zoning Appeal, that they can just be um, approved by the code director. So the Planning Commission has um, asked that the zoning um, language for Title 230502 um, be changed to where it says, um, where it, when authorized by the BZA, the substitution for a non-conforming use of another not more objectionable non-conforming use may be made. And to um, substitute the BZA with the code and um, the code director. So it's more on the spot, reducing the amount of paperwork and time of the um, BZA because they are really busy. So that's kind of in a, in a nutshell. Um, questions? Is there uh, any change to any notice requirements to neighbors, or are there notice requirements to neighbors? And was that discussed? It was discussed. Yeah. The neighbors would still be notified. I mean, the, the, the normal process still takes place, and if I may. Yeah. Um, some of you may remember we had the first ever, first in a long, long, long time, uh, meeting with all boards and commissions at the community center and it was during that meeting to where the president uh, or the chair rather of the Board of Zoning Appeals John Golsey you know raised the question at that meeting saying if we're seeing something over and over and over again and it's consistently being voted on five to zero um, is that something that we could bring up to the Planning Commission um, to where we could help streamline and, and I told him absolutely. That was the kind of feedback that we would love to see. We all know that there's sections in code as it exists that really aren't mo making major modifications to someone's property that would certainly trigger a Board of Zoning Appeals decision on something, especially something that, like uh, Council Member Fall has just mentioned. I, I will also say and again, I'm going to go kind of slightly off topic in terms of the board, but the Planning Commission also took up the cell tower minor modifications, which we kept seeing, which was basically antenna replacements. It wasn't changing height, wasn't changing the footprint, wasn't changing anything about the cell tower other than having to swap out the gear and put more state-of-the-art antennas on these, which again, it, the, the sizes of those, if anything, got smaller. 
And so we kept seeing this over and over and over again in the process for the, the telecommunication industry is it goes before the planning commission. It takes many weeks, if not months, to go through the process when at the end of the day we vote five to zero on something like that. Uh, and that council has authorized um, to occur at the level of the code enforcement office. The director of, of development and code enforcement can see these plans now. No change in height, no change in footprint. Uh, it's just swapping out the antennas, and therefore they can approve that. If there was a height change or a footprint change, then it has to go through planning commission fully and then to council to make a decision on that. And this is very similar to that, to where it's helping one of our boards and commissions streamline the process as opposed to it really slowing down what someone would like to do with their property in uh Right. Well, and, and one of the other issues um, that in in the the if you are sitting as um, a policymaker and you are seeing these decisions of five five zero um, over and over now, that also says that maybe that language needs to be looked at again. And I know that the planning commission has been reviewing because there are many sections of our code that haven't been revisited lately, and so we may want to um, update it because things have changed and um, people's attitude and uh, kind of the the ideas have changed to a degree about what is objectionable or what's not objectionable. And so we want to look at the, um, the language itself in code for the, and this is like a, a trigger. This is one of those triggers that I would say, um, we need to look at this language even further because if it's always going forward and it's always being um, okayed, because you don't want a, a lot of variances. That says to me, if you're getting a lot of variances that it needs to be revisited. Question, Sarah? I was just referring to the, the memorandum, and it, it says to replace BZA with service safety director or his or her designee. Um, would we be changing, that, changing it to that, and then the service safety director designates code enforcement director, or um, are we changing it to go directly to the director of code enforcement? The, the wording was um, service safety director, or it his or her designee. Correct. Yeah. It will still come through the planning. Um, it will still come through the Department of Development and, and Code Enforcement, yeah. um, and uh, because there's oversight at that level too with a BZA decision, or, or in this case, if this were to pass, this issue. Um, and then it would go to the service safety director to make the ultimate ultimate decision. We've not discussed whether there's going to be uh, a designee, but likely stay with the service safety director until we get this going and see how this all works out. That's, and this is pretty common language through the whole code, right. is yeah. the, the, and just, that's the hierarchy. The we, we've been talking about code enforcement, and I just wondered yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. which individual. So thank you. Uh, clarification from what was passed or mentioned at the Board of Zoning Appeals because they mentioned if the improvement does not change the variance. So the three, the last three variances that they approved, um, one of them was doing a front porch and a bad back deck, but another one was adding a totally new structure, a carport over a driveway. Another one was replacing a deck that was larger than the previous deck but still within the setback. And Correct. then the third example was an accessory structure that was renovated to add a bedroom and a bathroom onto a garage. So I guess my question is, who makes the decision at what point, oh, that's more than, you know, if the deck is larger, by what percentage, or is that going to be spelled out? That's the it'll objectionable. Be it, yeah. It'll be the, the Department of Development and Code Enforcement that makes that decision, much like they do now, to where they're looking at this, they're going, nope, this needs to go before the Board of Zoning Appeals. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Jeff? No. Questions from the audience? Come on down, Joni. <laughs> My name is John Kurnansky, 56 Mound Street, Athens, Ohio. A little background, I was, um, through 2017, I was 
on the Board of Zoning Appeals for six years. Um, and I experienced a lot of these situations that came repeatedly to the board. Um, upon leaving the board, I went through all my papers, but I did keep at least one sheet from each case that we heard. Um, I did not think we were very overworked. Uh, when I left the board, John Gosley, the uh, chair, sent me an email and said, we will miss you, Joan, because you were the one person that went and visited every single property. Um, so, having said that, I, I was very um, engaged in looking at what we had to review. And um, I thought maybe sometime in the future I might need these. And so, what I have are, I didn't get them all, but various cases that would possibly fit under this category of uh, the substitution category. Um, um, so I would like to direct two points to this issue. The first one is separation of powers. And I don't think we think about this very much in the city of Athens, but we have city administration, the mayor's office, uh, which also includes the code office, service safety director. We had le legislative, which is city council and all your committees. And we have the judicial, which is uh, the uh, law director and the board of zoning appeals. And the reason the board of zoning appeals exists well, in the old days, it used to be someone from the law office always sat with us a few times. Lisa did come because we were having controversial issues and I asked her to be present just to keep things clear because sometimes we were distracted and we were not legalese people. Um, and I think the issue in uh, section 230502A that is being requested to be changed from when authorized by the BZA to the service safety director or his designate is who and how we're going to determine the substitution for a non-conforming use of another not more objectionable non-conforming use when you're not using part of the government structure that is not totally attached to the code office. The BZA is totally separate. I have several cases here that we looked at that would probably fit under uh, non-conforming, but not of another, not more objectionable non-conforming uh, use. Uh, and I can give you the definition of use. It's in the code, uh, if you want. One was 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 totally refused by the board members, five to zero. Another one was refused uh, four to one, uh, and that was an object on Mound Street. Um, and there were several other ones that had perhaps at least one defecting yes vote. Um, so I know there were various cases that we would see repeatedly, but looking through all of my examples, what came up most was parking variances. Bingo. And that's, um, and, uh, that's in bulk controls uh, chart B, right? So um, I'm thinking it's really important to keep some of these cases uh, before the BZA because my second reason, transparency. Uh, if, if this responsibility, which is more than just, um, as Chris was mentioning, sometimes the decks are a little larger, um, um, sometimes the little extension is a little too far on the side setback, uh, but in having the BZA examine this by at least four citizen members that are 
appointed and approved by the administration and the legislature. The public has an opportunity to see these type of actions and how they are handled by city government. Also, adjoining properties, and it doesn't state this here, but adjoin adjoining property owners will have the opportunity to receive a notice from the code office when they're presented to the Board of Zoning Appeals so that they can appear or make comment. It also gives others who have a vested interest in what's going to happen to this property. And remember, this is affecting not just residential, this is all zones that you're talking about changing this. And I think that's, I mean, at the heart of me is the R1 zone, makes me nervous, right? But um, this is all of the zones. So the code can all of a sudden start making non-conforming uses at their discretion. And I'm not saying the code isn't capable or cannot do this, but to throw in another consideration, they're not even getting to my street for housing inspections this year because they don't have enough time. They're not going to do it till next year. I was checking on a property, right? And I, that's what I was told. So if we're already over max, over tax, how are they going to have time to talk to all the neighbors? And there will be no public notice. There always has to be a public notice with the Board of Zoning Appeals. And I, I think it's, it's really, um, really, my biggest problem is transparency. Um, I watched the uh, Planning Commission video. Um, uh, I didn't attend the meeting. And uh, Nancy Bain was the one dissenting vote. And I, I, I recommend that you look at that and listen to her comments, because what she said was, this is a slippery slope. Um, and um, you would have to ask her to define that. I have my own opinions on it, but I won't speak for her. But, you know, I respect Nancy, and we don't always agree, but um, because of her experience on the Board of Zoning Appeals, on City Council, on the Planning Commission, and as a city planner and a geographer, Nancy understands how the land lays and, and what's a good way to keep it as open and safe for the whole community as possible. Um, Unless you have questions, I rest my case as a former BZA member. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So, anybody have questions for Joni? Mm. So, I think this is a little bit similar to when we were talking about um, the master. Well, it's not a master. Um, when we were talking about cell um, development and those other things, when there was a question about transparency and um, the separation of powers. And um, we did come up with something that worked for everybody. Because I think that um, in the meantime, when we're not being able to look at the wording and changing code itself to make it more updated and such, that these other ways um, of making sure everybody's heard and that it is transparent is a really important thing. So thank you for bringing that up, and thank you for being on the BZA. It's probably the hardest commission to be on in the whole city, so. Oh, no, it was fun. <laughs> oh, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, you look yeah. like you're having a good time. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. okay. So I'm sure we're gonna have some more discussion about this. Oh, and good. Yeah, I think that when we can have more discussion and then go forward from there when we have more information also. No? Okay. Okay. Well, great. Thanks. Thank you. We'll move on to Finance and Personnel Committee. That's chaired by Council Member Reisner and also has members Butler, Crowell, and Katsis. Council Member Crowell could not be with us tonight, but the others are here. Wait till everyone gets settled in here. Thank you. Okay, we're all wired up. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Finance and Personnel has uh, just two bullet points tonight. Uh, the 2020 Public Defenders Contract uh, authorization, or should we say reauthorization, and then appropriations slash transfers. So 
taking the 2020 public defender's contract authorization. Um, I'm looking here at uh, the previous contract that we did for the uh, last year and the ordinance, proposed ordinance for the uh, reauthorization. Uh, allow me to read the proposed language an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into or to extend the agreement with the Board of Athens County Commissioners for the purpose of obtaining the services of the Public Defender's Office through December 31st, 2019. Section 1, the mayor is hereby authorized to enter into or to extend the agreement with the Board of Athens County Commissioners for the purpose of obtaining the services of the Public Defender's Office through December 31st, 2019. Section 2, the mayor is hereby authorized to expend up to $160,000 from the 2019 General Fund 101-106 Transaction Code 300 for said contract. And I'll allow the Mayor, you have anything to uh, say about this? No? Um, I've looked at, there's, there's different figures here. Um, the 2000, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this contract actually will extend into 2020, does it not? because of the, the way the, the state budget and our budgets kind of sort of overlap. They're, well, they're, they're off from they're, each yeah, other. Right. right. Yeah. And this is something that we've experienced. It's, you know, it seems every so many years we're having to go through this to make mm -hmm. adjustments. Right. Plus the, the rates go up and yeah, it just changes. Exactly. Yeah. Any questions from committee on this? This is something we, we have to have a public defender and uh, we are obliged to pay them. Uh, and this is our share from the county. Um, I think there has been some discussion between us and the Board of Commissioners about exactly how much each side should be paying, but in general, it's pretty much 50-50. So, mm -hmm. Member Butler, do you have anything to say? No, oh, thanks. Uh, Member uh, Costas. I'm good. Now, did, did we have, uh, has, has the rate gone up? In um, amount since last year? I mean, I, we probably don't have that information. The year before last, when we uh, went into this, the rates went up rather significant. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we were uh, making some uh, phone calls to Columbus trying to understand why the, the rates went up. But from what I'm seeing from the uh, uh, email from the clerk of uh, council is that um, uh, there may be a decrease this year. Okay. So, but there doesn't seem to be any explanation as to why. I can get that way. Okay, but uh, it'd be a good idea if we could actually nail down a, a, a firm figure what we are expending. So, just to make sure that our general fund is has some money left in. Solve it. Yeah. <laughs> any any questions, uh, Member McGee? Thank you. Will you please take take the stand? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't miss it. Um, just a, a simple question. Uh, the public often will ask the question whether the costs of the public defender's office are reimbursed at all through the, the court cost system. Um, and I just wondered if you would address that. Does the city recoup any of that money? Thank I you. have no knowledge of that. I'll defer to the administration. Yes, whether the costs of the public defender system, whether they're recouped at all through the court costs, which are imposed when somebody is in fact convicted of, of a crime. I can find that out for you, Mayor McGee. I don't know off the top of my head. Thank you. Yeah, but I, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. It is a question that comes up quite often. Yeah. The, the public is always concerned of, about their how their money is being spent, and uh, sometimes there's the resentment that our system does impose um, the right to have an attorney upon uh, governments. Yes, um, but uh, isn't one of the problems with, with that, the, the fact that a person needs a public defender mm -hmm. would probably indicate that they, for whatever reason, cannot afford an attorney of their own. If well, that, there's, there's no, that, no doubt that they're entitled to a public defender. Though. Right. The question is simply whether the system, if there's a process where court costs are assessed to the right. um, non-prevailing party, whether anything is um, 
done to recoup the costs of the public defender assistance. So. Well, let, let's take a hypothetical case where you have a, uh, a person for a traffic violation and they demand a public defender. They're okay. not, not entitled to someone. Okay. Uh, only for jailable offenses. Okay. Um, assault and battery. Okay. Okay. Um, two guys get in a fight, someone's harmed, or some punches are thrown. Okay, you're uh, brought up on charges. Uh, you plead your case, and the judge says, you know, I really feel sorry for you. I understand the circumstances. $10 fine, you're out of here. Okay, now, right then and there, you know that the costs of the public defender and all the court costs far exceed $10. Well, the court costs are assessed at $115 for anyone who's convicted. Mm -hmm. So in, this, in your particular example, there would be $115 plus that $10. Plus and my $10. question is whether out of the $115, any of it goes to the city to recoup the costs that we kick into the public defender system, or to the county for that matter. Mm -hmm. So it's just a question that the public has asked me quite often, and I, I did want to know the answer whether we could convey that to the public in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, appropriations and transfers. I only have uh, one item here, uh, $36,000 to parking enforcement for IPS back in services. Um, Mr. Mayor, do you have any information on that that you can share with council? Um, we have to pay a bill. Oh, okay. To IPS and the revenues there. I was looking at revenue um, from the parking meters, um, and so there is money there to transfer. Okay. Yeah. So there's no need for any. When is the bill due? I, that, that I don't know. I, I can find that out for you, Councilman Reisner. Be a good idea. Yeah. We we may already owe them, and they're going to sue us. We may need a public defender. Member Butler, you have any questions? Thank you. Right. Member Costas? I'm good. Okay. Audience? Okay. Well, that's all I have for finance and personnel. And we're on to City and Safety Services Committee with Council Member Butler chairing this and Council Members Grace and Paul. Thank you, President Isley. Offer a few moments and ticks of the clock to allow everyone to get settled up here. Uh, I do believe the council is probably in um, receipt of some of this information. Our public works director has uh, requested for council to authorize uh, the bidding of repair to um, of a broken sewer line, sanitary sewer line, to coincide with some um, review from FEMA at the federal level. And um, I'll offer the back explanation here. So we do have one talking point. Everyone's settled and situated. Um, for the committee, we're looking at Columbia Avenue sewer slip repair and design. So a little bit of back information. We have an aging infrastructure, as, as many are aware, in the city of Athens. Our founding, as the flag indicates, 1797. Uh, east of 108 Columbia Avenue, there's a sewer line there that is um, failing. It's approximately 300 feet long, and it's threatened as well by landslide. Uh, additionally, it's, as I acknowledged, it's aging, and uh, traditionally a lot of the sewer lines in the city were created out of clay pipe, um, which can last fairly long if it's not subjected to roots and other uh, issues that can, can uh, infiltrate and weaken the system. This particular sewer line also serves approximately 50 homes and um, failing is not, uh, is not uh, uh, advantageous to those, those homes in the city. So the city administration has indicated that a field survey and geotechnical analysis has been already performed and designed for retaining wall to stabilize the sewer as well as the hillside is in the final design stages. 
uh, according to um, Public Works Director Bob Hetty. So the city has applied for FEMA funding, and the FEMA, according to um, our notes here, the FEMA reimbursement would be about 87.5%, with 75% of that coming from the feds, and then 12.5% from Ohio EMA. And that would um, help cover survey and uh, design and, and costs. Um, we're awaiting for the submission of the final design and final construction cost to issue a determination, FEMA is, if they will reimburse the construction of the wall. Time extension um, from FEMA is granted. There was a, an extension from FEMA that was granted to us until December 20th of 2019. Um, so again, to, re to reiterate, the city is requesting, city administration is requesting for council to authorize the bidding of the repair and for that to coincide with FEMA's review and then also to award uh, construction contract contingent on FEMA's approval of the construction costs. Hope that covers everything. Um, if the mayor wants to add uh, any other details, I, I have one question. Sure, thank you, um, Councilman. How, how often have we applied for FEMA funding on one of these slips or anything like Armitage Road, right? Um, when they don't come through, and you know, how, right. then we you know are out some money, and then we ha also, I mean, as council member. Butler said, we can't not fix it. So I'm just wondering how, is it a good bet or a bad bet? <laughs> it's a bet, let me just say that. Um, I won't go so far as a good bet or a bad bet. Uh, we have applied for, several times this year for FEMA relief on slips in the city and we have been successful. Um, this one will be interesting to see where FEMA decides on this particular area and in particular for our, our sewer through there. Engineer Bob Hetty believes that this is gonna be roughly a $300,000 project um, to secure the sewer line that runs through that area. Um, where FEMA will land on that is, we have not heard back from them. So we don't know. And again, as Member Butler was explaining that 75% federal for a FEMA project so 75% of that potentially $300,000 project, of which we've already um, expended $35,000 on the engineering for, uh, for the project of this magnitude. Uh, and that too, if this comes through, will be reimbursed through the FEMA fund three, uh, 588. Um, if the, the federal FEMA um, does not come through with the money, is that automatically the state also, um, do they follow the lead of the of the feds? I believe they do. Okay. Which, oh. as Member Butler was saying, that's 12.5% from the state. So this is a very expensive project, potentially a very expensive project. Like all our slips seem to be. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman Grace, anything? Not at this time, thank you. Um, I, I believe there's someone in the audience. Uh, yes, I was gonna share, um, council um, was contacted by Mr. Peter Hoffman Pinther regarding some concerns as well, um, pertaining to nearby slip, as, um, which uh, could be related or um, potentially concerning as well. And he was in contact with Councilmember Crow, who is not here this evening. But um, um, Mr. Uh, Peter Hoffman Pinther is here this evening. Uh, if, he, if you'd like an opportunity to share a concern as well, thank you, sir. If you could just kindly state your name and address. Yes, uh, you'd say my name, <laughs> and my address is 108 Columbia Avenue. Uh, I, I would just like to say that uh, I appreciate the council considering this. Uh, this is a lot. This is a large project. Uh, 
and it affects, as you mentioned, 50 homes. It includes a number of the homes on Briarwood, Columbia, and Northwood. Uh, the sewer line, in this case, I don't believe is uh, ceramic, but it's another type of sewer line that's been there a long time. It has a lot of pressure on it because, as you know from Athens, if you live on the hillside, there's a great amount of pressure, and any time there's a lot of water because of the type of soil. Uh, so uh, it's really sort of necessary to make this repair. If we don't do it now, it'll, and the pipe is not protected. I've seen the drawings to, for the pipe, the protection of the pipe. They're, they're very solid. There are pylons going 20 feet into the ground and a wall behind it to protect the pressure on the pipe. Uh, it'll mushroom into a much bigger project if it's not done. And so th those are my comments. I think that uh, we've already seen some movement in the, in the uh, in the last 30 days on the property next to us, there's already cracks showing in their garage. It's passed behind the house about this this deep. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it's in movement. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. All the hills in and, and thank you for communicating with us as well this evening and via email. Um, and I just encourage you as well as all citizens um, to continue to do so, contact the, the uh, administration. Um, they're, they're able to get things done and, and continue to contact and communicate with legislative bodies. So thank you. I believe, um, President Nisley, that's all that I see on our agenda this evening, which would conclude this particular committee. Thank you. One comment. If, if, on the mic, thank you. Thank you, yeah. That way it's recorded and all can hear and... Uh, Representative uh, Kotsis has also been, I've also spoken to him, so he's aware, he's actually seen the, uh, the situation. So is uh, <coughs> Councilmember Crown. Crown. Yeah, they both seen yeah, the Council whole Crown situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I can th thank you, uh, Councilmember Kotsis, too, for being engaged. Thank you, President Eisen. Thank you all. We'll adjourn at 7.40 p.m. And the next council meeting will be on October 7th.